Good morning, everybody. Giving out your heart attack box, everyone's switching the microphone on. It is great to see you this morning. If you're here for the first time, brilliant to see you. We hope you feel at home and welcome, and that you're glad to join us up as we worship God today. I'm going to read from Micah chapter 6 as we come together to worship God this morning. Um, the people of God have a question for God, and it's this. What shall I come before the Lord with? And what shall I bow down with before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand grams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? And then God says this. He has shown you, or moguls, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This morning to meet with God, we come with humble hearts, recognizing who He is, and that the only reason we can come and meet with Him is because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So with humility, let's pray now, let's talk to God. Almighty God, this morning we come before you in humility because we recognize this morning that you are the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sovereign God. You're the God who is in control of all things. Nothing comes to pass without your hand bringing it to be. You, Lord, are responsible for setting up and bringing down the earth. You, Lord, are responsible for establishing empires and crushing them. You, Lord, are responsible for creating this amazing universe and sustaining it. Oh, Lord, you're the one who is responsible for making our very hearts beat. You're the one who's responsible for giving us every talent and every skill and every ability that we have. You, Lord, are responsible for giving us every opportunity to use the talents you've given us. O oh Lord, our God, with humility, we come before you this morning. Because we recognize this morning that without you, we can do nothing. Almighty God, you know how often we forget about you. You know too how often we don't appreciate you. You know too how often we don't have any praise or thanks to give you. You know, Lord, how often we push you right out to the edges of our life. You know, Lord, that so often we don't rely on you. So often we don't give you any thought. But so often we live as if you're just a tiny little part of our life on the fringes. But Lord, we want to say this morning that we're sorry for doing that. We're sorry for not recognizing your greatness and our smallness. And Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would remind us of your greatness, of your power, of your authority, of your sovereignty, of your holiness, of your grace, and of your amazing love for us. <coughs> Lord, help us this morning that by remembering who you are, that we would recognize what a privileged people we are to be able to call you our God. Almighty God, lead us to yourself this morning. Help us to see afresh who you are, the God who deserves all of our humble praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand together and lift our praise to God as we say praise is rising. Let's stand together and praise him.
Old Testament. So everything that happens in the book of Daniel happens before Jesus came. And what has happened is that God's people have been taken away to the, the empire of Babylon. They've been disciplined by the Lord. They've been taken away from the land. And in the land, we meet a number of characters who stand for God. So we've had Daniel, who stood for God in chapter 1. He wasn't going to eat the, the meat up from the king's table. And then last week, we saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing up against this idol that was set up. They wouldn't bow down. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace, but God rescued them. But the whole way through, we've seen that, that God's people have stood out. And here as we come to chapter 4 and 5, the focus moves away from God's people. It moves away from Daniel and from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it focuses on two of the kings of Babylon. It focuses on Nebuchadnezzar, who we met last week, and then one of his descendants called Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was, was later than Nebuchadnezzar. And this morning we're going to read from Daniel chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now these chapters are really, really long. And if I was to read both chapters and complete it, I actually think it would be close to a quarter to a time to go. So we're not going to do that, but I am going to read enough that you hopefully get an idea of what happens in these chapters. So let's read these together. The words will be on the screen. I'll read it aloud, but if you want to read along, this is God's word. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king says, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, bound with iron and bronze, in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O King, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O King, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, he says, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and 
live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about King Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and had grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. <clears throat> At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures for generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to the throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And then we move into chapter 6, and we meet another king called Belshazzar. Now that's not Belshazzar, that's Daniel's name, it's Belshazzar. And at the start of Daniel chapter 5, what Belshazzar does is he holds this big party in worship of idols. And as part of this party, he brings out some vessels that were taken from God's temple in Jerusalem. And he worships these idols with the things of God. But God doesn't give Belshazzar another chance. This hand appears, have you heard the phrase, the writings on the wall? Have you heard that phrase? It's from Daniel chapter 5. Because in Daniel chapter 5, this writing comes on the wall, and God says, You've been weighed, been found one thing, and this is the end of your kingdom. And it's sad because Belshazzar knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, and he didn't humble himself. Let me read just the last few verses of chapter 5. But you, his son of Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tackle, parson. This is what the words mean. Meaning God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found one thing. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. There's an awful lot in those passages, but hopefully what we're going to see is that God has one main message for us. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us as we come to look at this part of the Bible together. Let's pray now. Almighty God, we would pray that just now, that you would empty us. Empty us of all that prevents us from hearing what you want us to hear. Empty us of our preconceptions. Empty us of our preoccupations. Empty us of our prejudices. Empty us just now, Lord, that our ears and minds and hearts might be ready to hear your word and to be filled with it. Speak your truth to us just now. Through your word as it's preached, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is going to sound like a bit of a riddle, but it's not a riddle. It's from a book. The, the East Belfast genius C.S. Lewis, he said this, have a look at the screen. It says, there is one vice 
of which no person in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when they see it in others, and which hardly any people imagine they are guilty of. What is C.S. Lewis talking about here? What is this riddle all about? What he's talking about is pride. Pride. Now, don't get me wrong, not all types of pride are negative. In fact, there are some very positive kinds of pride. It's good to take pride in our work, isn't it? To work hard and to do our job well. It's good to take pride in our work. It's lovely whenever someone says that they're proud of us. And it's lovely to be able to turn to someone like a child and say, I'm proud of you. That is a good type of pride. It's good whenever people take pride in their possessions and their property, the things that God has given them. That is a positive type of pride. But there are many negative types of pride, aren't there? Types of pride that whenever we see them, we, we cringe. There's arrogance. Can you think of an arrogant person, you know? Someone who boasts about their greatness, who boasts about their wealth, who boasts about their ability. They stand up and they worship themselves. That type of pride is ugly, isn't it? The pride of arrogance. And then there's the pride of overconfidence. Those people who just think that they are the best at absolutely everything and they'll tell you outright how fantastic they are. They're so overconfident. And that pride, when we see it, it's, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? And then there's the pride of smugness. Smug people who, who look down on others. They think they're better than everyone else, that they know more than everyone else, and they stand up and above everyone else, and they look down their nose at others. When we see the pride of smugness, it's ugly and uncomfortable. But there is also a kind of pride that we find in the Bible. And what the Bible tells us is that God hates this pride. Did you know that the Bible says that God hates certain things? And one of the things that he hates is a certain kind of pride. What is the type of pride that God hates? It's the pride wherever I become greater than God in my own mind. Whenever you look at the word pride, the letter I is right in the middle. And the pride that God hates is whenever I exalt myself above him. Whenever I think I know better than him, Whenever I think I'm more important than him, whenever I place myself higher than him, that is the type of pride that God hates. And this type of pride, it says three things. The first thing that this type of pride says, it says, I don't need God. That's the first thing that this type of pride says. It lives life and it says to life, I do not need you, God. I don't need you in my life. I don't need you. The type of pride that God hates, it doesn't recognize God, it doesn't find God, it doesn't look to God for help, it doesn't consider God in any of its ways. It lives life pridefully saying to God, I don't need you. We see this type of pride summed up in Psalm 110. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. It doesn't seek God. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. The pride that God hates says, I don't need you. Another thing that this type of pride might say is, I don't know, it's not only that I don't need you, God, but I'm actually against you, God. I'm against you. I don't want to know about your ways. And if you tell me your ways, I'm not going to obey them because I know better than you. I am against you and your ways, God. The pride that God hates sets itself up against God and fights against God and rejects God and rebels against God. This type of pride refuses to listen to God. The king of Assyria was someone who held this pride. He, he fought against God and God's people. And in 2 Kings 19, look what God says, Who is it that you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. 
the type of pride that God hates is a pride that rebels against him, rejects him, and fights against him. And the third thing that this type of pride says is this. It says, I want your glory, God. I want your glory. Pride is an attitude which wants what God deserves. An attitude that wants all of the praise for something. That wants all of the glory, that wants all of the thanks, that wants all of the credit, and isn't bothered if God gets any. And again, we see this type of pride in the book of Acts. King Herod had, had given this speech, and look, look at what the people say, and look at his response. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. It was a sermon, if you like. Not about God, it was just whatever he wanted to talk about. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. The people were praising him as God. Then look what it says. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. There is a pride that is happy to take praise, but not give it to God. And this is a type of pride that the Lord hates. I don't need to God. I'm against you, God. I want your glory, God. And in Daniel chapter 4 and 5, we meet two people who have this type of pride. We meet King Nebuchadnezzar and we meet, meet King Belshazzar. And this morning what we're going to do is we're going to spend 98% of our time looking at chapter 4 and Nebuchadnezzar. So do not panic. And if you think Marty is spending a lot of time with Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to be here all day if he starts talking about Belshazzar. Don't panic. 98% of our time in chapter 4, just 2% in chapter 5, so don't panic. And what we're going to see this morning is how God deals with their pride. Okay, so that's where we're going. Now, one of the things that's amazing about the Bible is that, that it's not just in the Bible that we find the people in it. We find them in the history books. King Nebuchadnezzar was a historical person who was a king of the Empire of Babylon. You can read all about it in the history books. And whenever you read about it in the history books, he was incredible. What he achieved was absolutely astounding. He extended the empire far bigger than anyone could have imagined could be done in a lifetime. He just took over country after country after country and kingdom after kingdom after kingdom and empire after empire after empire that he had this huge, big empire. Military-wise, he was unrivaled. And then what he did within this empire was he, he made these beautiful cities. He, he built these cities that were just so complex and beautiful, with beautiful art. And they were all built because of his command. Babylon, the city that he lived in, was one of them. And then even within the city of Babylon, he, he built something which was classed as one of the ancient wonders of the world, the Hind Gardens of Babylon. He built it for his wife. What a lovely present. Whenever you read about Nebuchadnezzar, yes, you're going to see he was a tyrant. Yes, you're going to see he, he built his empire on the backs of the horse and the back of slavery. Yes, you're going to see that, that all of this he did in a, in, a, in a harsh way. But all that he did, all that he did was, was really incredible for a man to do. And what's happening to Nebuchadnezzar is that as he assesses all of his success, his success he just thinks it's all down to him. He's proud of his achievements. He thinks that he's done it all because of himself, and he gives God no credit and no praise and no acknowledgement. And again, you see that in verse 31 of Daniel chapter 4. Even though he's been warned to humble himself, look at what he says. He says, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Oh, look at all I have done, he says. Aren't I fantastic? Aren't I brilliant? Look at all I've achieved. And then do you notice what else he does? He's not only proud of himself, he not only forgets that it's the Lord who's put him in this position, and it's the Lord who's given him success, he's not only forgotten about that, and, and not acknowledged God in that, but there's a different type of pride that's also snuck in. 
He also wants the praise that God deserves. Look at the end of that verse. Look at all this wonderful stuff I built and why have I built it for the glory of my majesty. I built all this so that I will be praised. I've done all this so that my name will be great in the kingdom of Babylon and hopefully in the rest of history. King Nebuchadnezzar wanted all of the praise and all of the glory for all of the things that he had forgotten that God had actually done. Here's what happened to me as I read about Nebuchadnezzar this week. I was sucker punched. As I read about this and thought about this, I was absolutely sucker punched by this. Because I can relate to this. And my guess is that, that you probably can too. Do we not so often fail to acknowledge God when we accomplish something? Whenever we do something, whenever we're successful in something, whenever we do something that's brilliant, Whenever we achieve something, do we not feel to recognize that the only reason we've achieved it is because of God? Can you relate to that? Or what about this morning, the, the money that you have in your bank account, or the lovely house that you live in, or the family that you've got? Do we not feel sometimes, or a lot of the time, to recognize that the only reason we've got any of that stuff it's because God has given it to us. Even the talents that we have, we can boast about those without ever just acknowledging that the only reason we've got those talents is because God has given them to us. You see, what we have and what we've accomplished, yes, on one hand, it's down to hard work. Yes, it is. We've worked hard, we, we've put effort in, we've practiced things, we have worked hard at something, but ultimately the only reason we have success is because God in His sovereignty has decided that we're going to succeed. I don't know about you, but, but I find sometimes without really thinking about it, I don't acknowledge God and I don't give Him the thanks and the praise that He's due. And then there's the whole area of recognition. We all like to be recognized, don't we? We all like to be praised or thanked for the things that we do. And that's right, we should be thanked for some things. If we do something for something, we should be thanked. But one of the things that can happen is that we get so obsessed with being thanked or praised that we refuse to praise God or we forget to praise Him. If someone says to you, that was brilliant what you did there, it's okay to say thank you. But it's not okay to say thank you and then not praise God for giving you the talents and the ability to do it. It's pride. When we take all of the praise, when we take all of the recognition and give God none, it's pride. It's doing the thing that Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar was a successful man and he was proud about it and he didn't acknowledge God and he didn't praise God and he put himself above God. But what God does is he deals with Nebuchadnezzar in a very, very gracious way. Now, on the surface, you're going to be scratching your head whenever I tell you what God did. You're going, gracious, Marty, that's gracious. It is. And by the end of what we see what God did, hopefully you'll see how gracious it is. Of God. So let me just run you through what God did to deal graciously with Nebuchadnezzar. The first thing he did was that he warned Nebuchadnezzar that he was going to humble him. He told Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, you are proud, and I am going to bring you low. I'm going to humble you. That's what the troubling dream was about. That's what the interpretation of Daniel was about. It was a warning to Nebuchadnezzar. God warned him in advance. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, your pride has become so great, you have not acknowledged me as the sovereign God over all things. Your pride has become so great, what I am going to do is I'm going to bring you low. I'm going to give you the mind of an animal. You're going to go and you're going to ruin the fields. 
You're going to go up there in the early morning, the Jew is going to soak your hair. You're going to start eating the grass like a wild animal. Nebuchadnezzar, I'm warning you, this is what's coming your way. I am going to bring you low. Verse 25 tells us that. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat the grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives to them anyone he wishes. I'm going to humble you, Nebuchadnezzar, until you come to the point where you realize who I am and the glory I deserve. And again, you see that at the end there, don't you? It's going to happen until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Then you can ask, whenever you realize that you're not God, and I am, then you'll be restored. But I'm going to humble you. I'm going to break your load. So there's the warning. That was gracious. And then God also gave him a chance to actually repent before this happened. God gave Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to humble himself, to recognize there and then that God was talking. God gave him an opportunity to respond, to repent. Daniel goes to him, having given him the warning. And look what Daniel says. He says, therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Daniel was a prophet. Here's the advice of God to you. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. Do what's right here, Nebuchadnezzar. Recognize who God is. Do what's right here in Nebuchadnezzar. Humble yourself and praise the God of heaven who's given you the power you have. Humble yourself, Nebuchadnezzar. Do what's right. What grace is this? God tells him what he needs to do. God gives him a chance to repent. And not only does God tell him what to do, he gives him a chance, God gives him loads and loads of time to do it. He gave him time to humble himself. A couple of verses after telling the, the king to repent, we're told that it's 12 months later by the time he's humble. Nebuchadnezzar has 12 months to humble himself. 12 months to turn to God. 12 months to recognize God's sovereignty and authority and power. 12 months. And he doesn't do it. He refuses to humble Himself. We've had the East Belfast legend C.S. Lewis, but the other East Belfast legend is the Titanic. Just before the Titanic set sail, there was a news article about the Titanic. And in that news article, one of the people who worked for the White Star said this God Himself could not sink this ship. And they believed that. That's why they didn't put enough life rafts on the Titanic. In their pride, they looked at what they made and they said, God Himself could not sink this ship. And I imagine that's what Nebuchadnezzar thought. God could never humble me. I am the most powerful man in the world. God could, could never sink me. But he did. God did sink him. God brought him low. He humiliated Nebuchadnezzar. After all of his boasting, verse 33 tells us this. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people in that grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Nebuchadnezzar was brought low. There's actually a medical condition which is what he suffered from it seems. It's called boanthropy. And what it says about boanthropy, it says this, it's when a person in a delusional state believes themselves to be an ox or a cow and attempts to live and behave accordingly. 
That is the rare psychological condition that God seems to have caused Nebuchadnezzar to have. What an unpleasant state to be in. What a terrible thing to have happened to him. Where is the grace in this? Let me tell you where the grace in this is. Being brought low caused Nebuchadnezzar to look up. Being brought low caused Nebuchadnezzar to look up. Nebuchadnezzar says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, look what it says, raised my eyes towards heaven. Crawling about the field, having lost my mind, I eventually raised my eyes towards God. And my sanity was restored. And then what you see is almost a conversion. You see a changed man, look what it says there. Then I praise the Most High, I honor and glorify him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to, ten to generation. Being brought low caused him to live up. And by looking up, Nebuchadnezzar was transformed. Transformed. Made into a different man, a man who appreciated God and knew God and glorified God and trusted God and saw who God was. But he had to be brought low before he lived up. And we actually see that pattern in, in all sorts of places in the scriptures. We see it in the New Testament. There he was, Saul heading towards Damascus to arrest Christians, fighting against the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did the Lord Jesus do? Struck him with blindness, brought him low, blinded him. And then whenever his blindness went, he saw who Jesus was. Saul was brought low and it caused him to look up. And then there's the prodigal son. The prodigal son would never have gone home if he had never been in the pigsty. Brought low before he came to his senses and ran home to his father. Being brought low caused Nebuchadnezzar to live up. These passages are a warning for us. Sometimes we hear the word warning and we think of it as a negative thing. Of course it's not negative. If you go to a beach in South Africa and it's going to be fixing warning for sharks in the water, that's not a negative thing. That's something to help you, isn't it? That's so you don't get eaten by a shark. And these passages, they're, they're a warning to us this morning. And the warning is that, that we must be people who walk in humility before God. We're not to be proud and, and puffed up. We're to walk in humility before God. That's what 1 Peter 5, 6 and 5 and 6 says. It says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. It's a warning to us to be humble. Maybe you're wondering, how do we do this? How do we walk in humility before God? Well, there's practical things we can do. We can pray in dependence to Him every day. Relying on Him for everything that we need. That's an act of humility. We can open up the Bible and, and come under the authority of His Word and live in light of it. That's an act of humility. Say, God, you know better. Speak to me today and help me to live in light of Your Word. Those are outward things that we can do which show humility. But the only way that we'll really get to the point of, of walking in humility is if we get the bigness of who God is. It's only if we actually let the truths about God and who He is and what He does impact our lives. It's only whenever we get that God's given us our talents that we won't boast about how great we are, but we'll thank Him for them. 
It's okay that whatever we get, that God is actually sovereign and in control of your life and all of the good things you have and enjoy are because of Him. That we won't take any pride in our achievement, but we'll give praise and glory to Him. The cure for humility is not to think more, more less of ourselves. That's not the cure. It's to think rightly and more of God. Just on a side note, over the past six months, in fact longer now, is it? The whole world has been humble. The whole world has been humble. This little tiny virus has brought the whole world to its knees. And if we believe what the Bible says about God, then what we believe is that God is sovereign over this whole thing. That he's not up there panicking and thinking, what's happened here? Didn't see this coming. No, what has happened is that, that he is actually in control of this. We are running about as governments and individuals and we are clueless of how to deal with this virus. We're experiencing the humbling of humanity. And you know what's really frightening? No one's turning to God. No one's calling for us to turn to God in this. First Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God tells the people in the land that, that he will make curses upon them if they turn from him. If they become proud and become proud, he says that I'm going to bring curses on your land. But then he gives them the instruction of what they're to do whenever that happens. And I'm sorry, it's on the slide before I think I'm doing. God says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now this was a promise given to, to God's Old Testament people in a very specific situation. But we're nowhere near this today, are we? We're not seeking God. We're not praying to Him. We're not asking Him to have mercy on us. Instead, in pride, we're saying, we are going to sort this out ourselves. I just don't know if God is going to bless our cure for a vaccine until we humble ourselves. He may. He may out of grace. But he might not. But let us be people we humble ourselves, even if the world doesn't. Let us be the people who pray to the Lord and ask Him to bring a vaccine, to bring a cure, to, to heal our land. We have seen the humbling of society. That was very gracious of God, what He did to Nebuchadnezzar. And this morning, He gives you a gracious invitation to, to humble yourselves too. But what we see in chapter 5, which is 2%, so it's about 2 minutes, what we see in chapter 5 is that Belshazzar did not get another opportunity. Belshazzar knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, and Belshazzar lifted up himself in pride and went against God. He mocked God by taking the, food, the, the vessels and toasting other gods with them. And in his pride, God simply judged him. He was punished. His reign was taken to an end. And he was killed in battle when the Persians came. The example of Nebuchadnezzar was meant to be enough for him. But he didn't turn from his pride. You know that as your minister, I love you. Genuinely mean that. I love each of you. I, I care about you deeply. And it's because I care about you that I, that I need to say this to you. There are some of you here this morning 
And your pride is the thing that is leading you to hell. And what I mean by that is this, is that you've been told the gospel. You've been told the great and wonderful and amazing news that Jesus has come to forgive your sins. You've been told the incredible news that God, out of love for you, sent his son to die for you. And that all you need to do to be saved is to turn to Jesus and turn from your sin. It's that simple. Here's the gift of forgiveness, God says, and I am offering it to you because you can't save yourself. And God says, all you have to do is take it, receive it, take it as your own. Some of you this morning in your pride are saying no to that gift. Some of you think that you're going to be able to get to heaven by bypassing Jesus Christ. What pride do you have? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. But in pride you're saying, well, well I can get there if I be Jesus. What pride is going to be shown on that judgment day? When you stand before God and he says, what did you do with my son? And you say, I rejected him because look at my righteousness, God. What pride you will have on that day. Some of you here this morning, it is your pride that is getting in the way of turning to Christ. You're too proud to accept the vaccine for your sin. For me, as your minister, that is heartbreaking. 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 Oh, but this morning, would you just get your pride? Would you let go of it? Would you walk in the room of humility this morning? Would you come to Jesus Christ this morning and say, hey, Lord Jesus, I come with all of my sin. I come with all of my shame. I come with all of my pride. I give it to you this morning, Jesus. Forgive me. Save me. Cleanse me. I know I can't save myself, but I'm sorry that I've been trying. Save me this morning, Lord Jesus. Maybe this morning you could use the words of the great hymn. Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to you for dress. Helpless look to you for grace. Vile I to the fountain fly. Wash me Savior. Or I die. Let's pray together. So for God we confess this morning that all too often we are guilty of the sin of pride. Often we think of ourselves more highly than we should. Often we think of ourselves as being more important and greater than you in our lives. All too often we take all of the praise and give you none. Oh Lord, forgive us this morning. Forgive us for trying to live life without you. Forgive us for failing to acknowledge you. Forgive us whenever we don't give you the praise that you deserve. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you that in your sovereign plan, you, you sent your Son that we could be forgiven and cleansed and changed. Well, Lord, grant us humility as your people. Grant us a willingness to listen to your voice. Make us humble, we pray, not by thinking less of ourselves, but by thinking rightly about you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing a final hymn which reminds us that our only hope is humility and our only hope is in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing in Christ alone. <clears throat>
now and forevermore. Amen. Please take a seat as there's just a few announcements and then I will dismiss you. Um, tonight, John McCracken is being licensed in Abbey Presbyterian Church, so he's officially becoming the assistant minister tonight. Um, it's, there's not an invitation for you, unfortunately, because there's limited space, but you can watch it online at 6.30 on Abbey Presbyterian Church's Facebook page and website. Just their Facebook page, so tune in there. But we're also meeting here tonight at 7 o'clock. Um, we're looking at a series called Questions, Big Questions that we ask as Christians, and questions that maybe others are asking too. And tonight the question that we're looking at is, who on earth is the Holy Spirit? Ever wondered that? We've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who on earth is the Holy Spirit? And Scott Monteith is answering that question tonight and taking the service. So come out to hear Scott and find an answer to that question. Um, also, just to let you know that yesterday Lauren and Johnny were married here. They had a great day. And so when they're back next week, or when Lauren's back, you can congratulate her for that. And also just some sad news this morning. We learned on Tuesday, no, on Wednesday, of the passing of Sadie Douglas, who was in Killingford Nursing Home. Uh, she passed away on Wednesday morning, and her funeral is going to be this Tuesday in the church building. But I'd ask you please to pray for her family, pray for her son Norman, and her daughter Anne, as they grieve at this time. Okay, the first out is going to be those who've got children in Shine or Presh. So you can go first. And then uh, the upstairs will be dismissed next, and then the downstairs. So ushers do your thing, and the praise by the Lord.